Yeah, welcome back to this course functional genomics. Uh, this is the fourth lecture for week 1 and um, in the previous uh, lectures we have seen the evolution of the field of genomics and how uh, what kind of impact that it could have. So, we are going to continue discussing on genomics and we are going to look into the approaches people use used in the past and currently being used for the uh, understanding of genome and how it functions. Let us look at this slide here, what is shown is, is an abnormal condition, a condition wherein uh, you can see that the two digits are fused together and, and, and this condition is called as syndactylic, the fused food. This is a kind of a partial condition because it is not completely fused, so this region is anyway separated. But you could have conditions for example, here like in this baby's uh, hand, all the you know three digits are fused together, again this is an abnormal condition, it happens because of some genetic defect. So, how do you really find the gene that results in or defect in that gene results in this kind of condition? This is something that um, you know people for the human they look into the pedigree and look at how this phenotype or abnormalities run through the family and try to come up with certain models and that results in the identification of the gene. So, depending on what kind of organisms you use the you know the approach varies. For the human we start with this kind of pedigree, this is a female, this is the male, this is line indicate they are married and they have got three kids two sons and one daughter, one of them is affected having again syndactyly in his generation next to the next you find a person is affected, here also affected and so on right. So, this is the mode by which you understand that it is something has to do with genetics because it runs in the family and so on right. So, how do you really find the gene? So, obviously gene is located on the chromosome, on the DNA and one has to go and look at it right. So, how it is normally done? So, this is let us assume this is the gene that causes the disease and it causes the disease because it has some mutations variation in the DNA. Let us say a normal gene has these sequences and they code for this particular protein, but in these individuals you have a gene whose sequence has been altered like what is shown here. For example, the G is converted to A as a result instead of the amino acid tryptophan you have a stop codon the peptide no longer be made is a truncated peptide and it cannot make the protein. So, as a result one might have it right just giving an example not necessary that this is the mutation that causes the condition that you have seen. So, how people go about looking at it? So, they do what is called as um, pedigree analysis and the use the DNA markers located on various chromosomes, these markers are repeats and with the repeats you know which repeat allele often present in the affected and not in the unaffected, we are able to locate a possible region of the chromosome which could harbor the gene and using you know the genomic technologies um, you will be able to identify a given gene to be the gene that causes the disease because now we have sequence and you found there is a sequence change and that is present in all the affected therefore, that is likely to be the gene that causes the disease. This is the way you go about looking for the gene in the humans and this is called as positional cloning. So, this is approach is called as from phenotype to genotype. So, you looked at individual that have some variation and go and look at what is the gene that causing that phenotype right that is called as phenotype to genotype and very similar approach is being used classical genetics in for example, in, in, in drosophila this is wild type meaning a normal insect fly, but you could have variants of genes which gives distinct phenotype for example, you know you have much darker you know body of the fly called a bony 
vestigial wing you can see that wing is much smaller or could curled wings the wing became you know distorted and so on. So, this is again a phenotype and for example, Morgan used these phenotype to link to map it on the chromosome and say that indeed there is something on the chromosome that gives this phenotype. Okay? So, there are markers which help us to identify that. So, this is how we have really looked into and deciphered for example, what is shown here is an X chromosome of Drosophila and is able to map that the gene that gives the yellow body color is located here, that gives a white eye color is located here that gives a phenotype of small wing called as miniature is located here is able to do that. He did it by what is called as linkage analysis meaning how often a phenotype is segregated together when you cross you know having different you know phenotype. And that gives you if the two genes are linked together then present close to each other then more likely that the phenotype is seen together right. And that led to mapping genes on the chromosome the first time you know that is for this he has been awarded a Nobel Prize. And again this uses the same approach that is phenotype to genotype just like what you have seen in human that is possible much later, but in fly he is able to do much much before. But the current approach for majority of the genes to understand what is the function of course, you know whatever Mendel has done. Now, people have sequenced identified the genes and they are able to tell exactly why a defect in a gene can result in this phenotype. But what people are trying to do now is to do the reverse. Okay? I have this gene, but I do not know what is the function of the gene. So, I make some changes in the DNA of that particular you know representing that gene and see what is the phenotype. So, this is called as reverse genetics because you start with the genotype and ask what would be the phenotype. So, just to distinguish these two, this is the classical forward genetics which is phenotype to genotype. So, you either expose the fly to certain mutagen which chemicals or whatever which randomly produce some mutation or it could be natural variation resulting in a given phenotype. And then you go and look at you know as compared to this fly how different they are and identify the genotype that unique to this fly which is we call as a mutant. In the reverse genetics you do not really bother about what would be the phenotype you take a gene that you want to study and induce mutation for example, I have changed it therefore, now it has become a truncation of the peptide if it is transcribed translated and then look at you know all the fly that has got this mutation as to what is the phenotype and I may find for example, as and when I create this mutation the fly becomes this phenotype. So, I can now link this phenotype with this gene more easily right. So, this is called as reverse genetics. So, why do you need reverse genetics? Because this is how it led to the new field of genomics. Why do you need it? Because there are redundancy in gene function because when you have a forward genetics it does similar thing why do you need reverse genetics? The, at times for the lab you know animals or models like this there could be the same phenotype is given by two different genes. So, even if you mutate one the other one is giving that phenotype. So, you will now be able to get that phenotype in a in a forward genetics. In reverse genetics I can bring in one mutation again I can bring in another mutation. So, you know uh, that is uh, possible in case of reverse genetics. Sometimes the mutation could be fatal meaning that mutation may not come to the population. So, you will miss out in a in a in a classical genetic screen whereas, in reverse genetics I know that whenever I make this the fly dies that I know that it is a lethal phenotype which otherwise you would miss out. The phenotype could be very subtle you cannot see that. So, in a when you do a forward genetic screen you may not minutely check each animal because you do not know which one carries the mutation. So, you miss out a obvious non obvious uh, phenotype, but when you do create a mutation you know that this fly has got for example, a mutation. So, you can more closely observe that fly and find a difference which tells connects the genotype with the phenotype. Now, in forward genetics you have no control which gene you are mutating, but here we can you know mutate the gene that you want that is possible. And in classical genetics you cannot say which kind of mutation you want to create. For example, I want to create what is called a missense mutation instead of X amino acid I want to bring in Y amino acid in a given region 
of a protein and see what kind of effect you have that is possible in reverse genetics. Tissue specific effect for example, what is the effect of this gene or this mutation in heart or in a nervous system. So, you do not affect the other, but only affect a nervous system that is possible in reverse genetics not possible in forward genetics. And then you know the another important thing is the reverse genetics can link a gene with unknown function you do not know what is that and with an with a phenotype. So, you understand the function of the gene and finally, you can classify what are the genes that are essential for the survival, what are the genes that are redundant in survival when you do a reverse genetic because you know you create mutation they do not die, you create mutation they are normal which you would have missed out if you do a you know forward genetics. So, there are the genetics reverse genetics is doable only in model system not doable in humans, not doable in many other larger animals which take long time to breed. For example, there are many model system depending on what kind of analysis you do with nervous system it could be Aplesia, genetics, development, reproduction, C. elegans, zebrafish development you can understand of course, Drosophila and so on. There are many models when it comes to more closer to the human it is a rat and mouse people use for understanding the gene function and their physiology. So, now people have done a large number of such mutations and these are databases that are available. For example, you have a database called Flybase which gives you what gene, what phenotype. For example, you, you go and you know you select this particular tab and give that curly wing. It will tell you what are the genes that results in curvy you know uh, wing phenotype and so on. For example, more generic database or ensemble again you know you go to this, this is European um, repository you go and take for example, click here what are the species you can select there are a large number of species the genome has been annotated some of the mutation is available mutant phenotype available or you can go to this more popular NCBA National Center for Biotechnology Information website and you can you know go and browse the organism database it gives you all the organisms you get their genome, DNA sequence and, and so on stool. So, if you when you have this database you can go and look at genes and you want to ask a particular question that what is the function of the gene that is what you want to test. So, the question is with all this new technology do you really need forward genetics. So, now I can mutate anything. So, why do you need forward genetic the classical genetics is it redundant now in today's life the question the answer is no it still it has its relevance. The process of reverse genetics where you create mutation and ask questions is laborious time consuming right and at times unpredictable you know what would be the outcome you do not know right. So, the forward genetics gives you a relatively simpler tool and you can quickly do that and still it has relevant and here you do not need to when you do a you know a forward genetic screen where you expose the animal to certain chemical which causes some defect somewhere you do not know where it does not really require the knowledge of the gene or genome because I can take a new species whose genome has not been studied still I can do. So, that is still a big big plus for that. The other thing this is important you know if you have a mutant background again I can subject that mutant strain to another round of you know random metagenesis using classical genetics. I may come up with a suppressor and answer for example, a second mutation may reverse the phenotype to normalcy or it can make it worse. These are all you know still possible using forward genetics. So, still you know these are relevant and likewise mutation in regulatory region can be mapped. So, you have a region upstream of a gene now it is mutated now the gene become non-functional right. And finally, when you look into then you can find a regulatory region is important which would have been very difficult if you go for a reverse genetics because reverse genetics more often you know the coding sequence you do not know the regulatory sequences. So, this approach still gives you the understanding. So, therefore, it is extremely important even today to continue the conventional studies, but you know top up with the reverse genetics approach you can handle and understand and you know uh, answer important questions. Let us see how we can use this for example, you have 
go to ensemble and select for example, all genome, you go to Amazon Molly, it's a fish and ask a question, okay, you know, do I have a gene of my interest in this animal? I say EPM2A, it says yes, it is there, it is present in this region, all these details it is given, the sequence is given, where is expressed given. Now, I can go and want to create a mutation like this, right? convert the gene having a mutation and make the mutation in the fish let us say and ask what phenotype it will have, right. How do you do go about doing it, ok. So, uh, you know you need to model, right. Uh, so, there are various ways people do, let us not get into that. So, let us first ask question as to how you can create a mutation in a DNA. Let us say I want to change the base G and make it to A, therefore, this codon become a stop codon. So, this is called a site directed mutagenesis. So, how do you do this? So, the requisite is that you need to have the gene cloned, cloned in a plasmid. Plasmid is a you know circular DNA that harbors a gene sequence. So, you have a plasmid in which a particular gene sequence from here to here is you know cloned and you have it here, it is a double stranded. What do you do now? So, let us say that your sequence is here, this is something that is for example, A and T, you want to make it to G and C, this is complementary sequence. What I do? I make oligonucleotides, which you otherwise call as primers, which span that region and such that the new sequence that I made has got the desired you know changes. So, it goes anneals to all the sequence except this sequence because now it has got A here. So, I introduced for example, C therefore, it will not pair. So, likewise on either side I made it that is what is shown here, this region has got the change. And then of course, you allow the DNA polymerase is going to copy the whole section, likewise from here it is going to copy all the section and you are going to make you know a two new DNA strand which are primed by the primer having desired mutation and that would have everything identical except that you have created a mutation here, right. Now, you have this new DNA strand, also the original DNA strand that plasmid had, right, the wild type 1. So, how do you select this and remove this? So, if, if you extract the plasmid DNA from E. coli, normally the E. coli, you know, add methyl group to certain bases of the DNA and there are restriction enzyme which will cut the DNA if the DNA is methylated. So, if I use for example, an enzyme called DPN1, which would look at the DNA which has got the methyl base, it will you know degrade, it will cut here and there. So, the plasmid is no longer functional. Whereas, the DNA that I made using a primer in a test tube will not have the methyl group, so they survive, it does not get digested. So, now if I use this DNA and put it inside an E. coli bacterium, now this would get in there because it has every other element like the original plasmid, it can replicate, it can survive an antibiotic medium because resistant gene. Now, it grows and if it grows, I know that it has got a plasmid in which I have introduced the particular residue being mutated. So, now, you know I had a wild type gene, right, of the fish that I wanted to work on and I have created a mutation that I found in the human. Now, I want to put it inside the animal and ask the question, now if I replace the normal gene with this mutant version, what would happen to the animal, right. So, that is the process by which people do. So, that is the process people do and I am going to discuss one such approach called gene knockout, ok. So, you can remove a gene from the genome of every cell and ask the question as to what happens to the animal, right. So, let us this approach is done, you know you can use it in mouse or fly or for example, plant. This is successfully carried out, maybe there is a difference in the technique, the approach, but it is doable. You can remove the gene from the organism either in all the cell or in a particular group of cells that is doable. Let us look at how you can create what is called as a knockout mice or you delete a region of the gene, therefore, the gene becomes non-functional using you know this approach in in species say for example, mouse. So, what you need is you have to identify a region that you would like to delete or mutate, right. 
and normally this is taken as the first exon of a gene. So, you delete that or a region of an exon a coding region that gives a functional domain for the protein. Let us say this is the region we selected and that is there in your plasmid. Now, what you do is that a region on, a, on flanking this particular coding region is selected from the uh, genomic library of that particular organism and then what you do is you have taken flanking regions and then instead of this important region you put for example a, a, a small segment of a foreign DNA which codes for for example a neomycin resistance protein right. We will talk about why it is. So, this segment carries now a neomycin resistant coding sequence and you know so once you have this what will happen is that you, when you make this construct right. So, you have a construct in which this segment is identical to the gene here and here, but this region which you want to delete or mutate it is removed, but in that region you have placed a foreign DNA having a small segment of neomycin resistant gene. Now, what do you expect that to happen? So, if this gets into a cell, okay, a mammalian cell for example, mouse cell, so now you have the chromosomal DNA in which this exon is here. So, that this DNA would go, this is your neomycin resistant gene, but these two regions are identical. You expect a process called as homologous recombination in which you know there is a cut in the DNA here and here and this segment gets in and that segment comes out. We will explain it in the second slide. And then how do you select these cells? Now, you can grow these cells in the presence of an antibiotic called neomycin and cells that do not have this protein coded by the neomycin resistant gene would die. So, in other words cells that survive in a medium containing neomycin are those cells in which you know your DNA is integrated in the genome and it is coding for the neomycin resistant gene. So, this can happen in two different ways one if it gets in exactly the same place replacing this exon as we wanted or it can get integrated elsewhere and still codes for the neomycin resistant gene. So, how do you distinguish these two population of cells? So, what people do is that at the other side of this DNA they code for some toxin. They put a DNA that codes for some toxin. So, this protein is made the cell is killed. So, however, if the integration is happening because of homologous recombination meaning you know the homologous sequences are identified and the DNA cut happens here and there it exchanges this toxin region will not get into the genome. As a result you know this cell would not have this toxin coding sequence inside the genome. So, it will not make that protein. So, it will live and it also live because it has now the neomycin resistant coding sequence. So, it codes for the protein therefore, it lives in a medium containing neomycin resistant gene. So, this is how you are able to replace a small segment of the genome in a cell in a group of cell and then you identify these cells right. So, what are these cells? So, these are the cells that are called as embryonic stem cells. So, these are basically you know derived from a blastocyst you know this is sperm and, and egg that fused and then you have this blastocyst and then you can disassemble this blastocyst and you have this cell these are called as embryonic stem cells because they have the capacity to differentiate into any part of your body. They have the stemness that is what they call. Now, what you do is that the, the construct that you have created that we discussed a little later little before you can introduce into the cells that are shown in the dish like this and then in some cells you know you would have the integration as I said for example, you have the homologous sequence they recombine. So, when you, the recombination takes place the neomycin gene gets into the genome and therefore, when you plate them in a plate containing the neomycin antibiotic only this cell in which this integration took place would survive. So, you have all the cells that in which you know this change this region of the gene disrupted. So, what do you do after that? You take these cells inject into a blastocyst this is an embryo about to differentiate. So, you put in there there is a cavity here you can take about 10 to 12 cells and then you take this embryo put into what is called the foster mother, mother who accepts embryo of other origin foreign uh, female other female and then you have you know the 
chimera bonding. So, that is what it is shown here. So, for example, the recombination happens here and here, the neomycin gone there and you mutated the gene. This is the blastocyst um, mother uh, in which the blastocyst is put inside and then the, the embryo develops into an animal and and, and what you can find is normally the people use the embryonic stem cells having different um, uh, from different uh, strains that have different coat color. For example, the embryo is from a female which has white coat color, but the embryonic stem cells could be from a species or a mouse strain that has got say brown or black coat color. So, whichever segment of the skin derived from the embryonic stem cells that we integrated inside would have that coat color. So, therefore, I know that this is the chimera having some part of tissue derived from the embryonic stem cells. So, it could so happen even the germ cells you know would some of them would be derived from the embryonic stem cells and if you cross them with for example, another you know male or female having white color and you look into the coat color any color any newborn animal which is having say brown color or darker color likely to have derived from a gamete from this embryonic stem cell because it is not white. Then I know this is 50 percent chance that it would have the allele that is removed or mutated and you cross these two and you will get an animal which is likely to have the knocked out gene right. So, then you look at what is the phenotype of this animal and this is how you create you know knockout animals. But at times it could have a problem that, that when you knock out the gene the animal may die. So, you do what is called as a conditional knockout wherein you restrict the mutation to only certain tissues that is something that we will discuss in the next class.